Welcome to um, a very important webinar. Uh, I know that uh, more than 100 uh, will be attending this webinar. So um, a warm welcome to all of you. So uh, my name is Oli Ottersen. I'm um, having this welcome address um, uh, since uh, I'm the chair of the advisory board of uh, the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education. So it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce you to the topic that we are to discuss today. In fact, what we are looking at is um, the backdrop provided by the paper that was published just um, a couple of days ago in The Lancet with the title, Teaching Sustainable Healthcare to the Critical Medical Humanities. So I should say that uh, it's a milestone for she, the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education, to get this mission, so to speak, printed in the Lancet. And uh, we are very happy also, as you will see later, to have on board the um, senior executive editor of the Lancet, who will uh, be providing some comments on uh, this very topic. Before giving the floor to um, Jessica Bagnall from um, The Lancet, I would say that, uh, well, milestone, if we look back to see how medical education has changed over the years, it's really impressive. I reread this morning the Flexner Report, 1910, that has been so instrumental in forging medical education in so many countries, including not least the United States. But uh, I think we all realize that uh, if we go back to this report, it's very much about uh, biomedicine and uh, quality. But uh, the aspects that we are discussing today, sustainability, equity, diversity, to be uh, a bit kind to Flexner, these elements are not very much in place in the Flexner report. Then 100 years later, uh, Jessamy, as we discussed today, the Lancet published uh, the Frank uh, Lancet Commission report on medical education. And we see the fantastic development. Now, Julio Frank and colleagues that talk about not only informative skills or education, formative uh, uh, skills that is introducing values, but also about transformative skills that uh, our students must know how to be change agents. But I should say that today we are introducing a fourth word characterizing education, going from informative, formative, transformative to a word that you don't find in any vocabulary, sustainative, sustainative education, where you combine the frank transformative skills with the skills that we need, in fact, to address the sustainable development goals. So keep in mind a new word as of today, sustainative education, sustainative skills. And with uh, this uh, new word, I would like to uh, introduce to all of you, senior executive editor of The Lancet. Happy to have you on board, Jessica Bagnall, please. Thanks so much, Ole. Um, my name is Jessamy Bagnall and I'm a senior editor at The Lancet, where among other things, I lead on a lot of our clinical strategy. Um, when I first started medical school in 2003, that was during the Millennium Development Era, I don't remember a single teaching session on what these goals were or how they might be relevant to me as a doctor in training. And when I chose to intercalate medical anthropology, it was met with some raised eyebrows and suspicion. In fact, it was considered a very alternative choice indeed. But that diversity of thought, the critical approach to humanities and the intersection with um, medicine and its history has been a crucial foundation for all of the varied roles I've performed in my career from surgeon in the NHS to an editor at The Lancet. But 2023 is a very different space to 2003. Young people growing up now entering medical school and training to be healthcare professionals face a far more uncertain world, one that sees the consequences of the climate crisis on an almost daily basis. I recently saw a video created by healthcare students of different professions from across the world addressed to healthcare leaders. And it started with this. Dear healthcare education leaders, I feel ill-equipped to prevent the health harms of climate change that my patients and communities face. This is not just clinically, but also socially and politically. 
The Centre for Sustainable Healthcare Education at the University of Oslo's Faculty of Medicine has a much broader scope than the climate crisis, and you can read about that in their recent comment published in The Lancet. But at its heart, it's about equipping students with the tools, context, cross-cultural and breadth of critical thinking that they need to see the sustainable development goals as more than 2D nice to haves and to see the 3D interconnected picture of power, health, politics and histories that can catalyze change. We were delighted to publish this comment in The Lancet and I'm delighted to be here today. I'll leave it there. Uh, just me and I uh, should tell everybody attending here that uh, the Lancet was also the journal that published um, the Frank report, commission report in 2010. And as you said, this was updated, I think it was last year. Uh, That's right, it was updated last year. Please don't yeah. please go and take a look at it. it exactly. Mm -hmm. It summarizes what's happened since 2010 and also particularly some of the changes post COVID 19. And I think there's a lot in there about convergent science, about the need for healthcare professionals to balance that, you know, very narrow and specialised training that we often have to have with also the complexities of the world we face. And, and that's that's a challenge. It's difficult. No one's saying it's not. So thank you again, uh, Jessamy. And um, now I should tell you that uh, there is a slight change in the programme. Helen Clark was supposed to contribute, but uh, she has a very, very good excuse that we must uh, accept. She's uh, in the field somewhere uh, in uh, Nepal, I believe it is. So uh, I guess you all understand it will that it would have been very difficult for her to take part today. But uh, we send our best uh, regards and thoughts to uh, Helen Clark because she has been uh, very instrumental in uh, forging the uh, thoughts and ideas that uh, provide the, the foundation for the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education. With these words, I would like to uh, call upon uh, Eivind, Eivind Engebretsen, whom you all know, and uh, who is the head of uh, the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education. We will hear more about what uh, she represents and what it is. Thank you. And Eivind, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ole Petter, and thank you for these very inspiring introductions. Um, I will actually uh, provide an outline of the main content of, uh, of the paper as a kind of a point of departure for our, for our discussions. Uh, and um, while, while many medical schools have now started to include the SDGs and sustainability in their curricula, they tend to focus mainly on green healthcare, but they ignore wider aspects of sustainability, including partnership, decolonization, and just transformation. And we have several visions for transforming medical education that we try to summarize in this, this short paper. First of all, students must learn to, to challenge the very systems, hierarchies, and structures that created the problems we seek to solve. As Audre Lorde famously stated, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Secondly, students must critically examine the underlying assumptions, premises, and biases associated with the prevailing concept of sustainability. And this implies shifting focus from a didactic, these are the facts approach to a transformative approach. Look at this conf these conflicting claims. How might you interrogate them? So students must learn to engage with different views, different values, different voices as a positive force for democratic debate and radical change through agonistic pluralism that transforms conflict into positive engagement and, and dialogue. And for this purpose, the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education has created the so-called Oslo Medical Corpus, which is a digital platform for data-driven learning in health that features a large 
database of text and documents and an open source uh, analysis and visualization uh, set of tools designed to uncover uh, un uh, to uncover underlying conceptual challenges and, and paradoxes. And thirdly, we suggest uh, a teaching model that inspires students to develop grassroots indicators that reflect local realities and challenge conventional metrics. Sustainability measurements are often based on Euro-American uh, perspectives using top-down approaches to, to data collection, which can maple, make people distrust the results. So students must learn that a uh, green transition can result in green colonialism if human rights are not safeguarded and local systems of observation, practice, and indigenous knowledge are not taken into account. So it, if we compare the standard approach to the SDGs to SDGs teaching with our approach, um, and uh, Jessamy already summarized uh, this very well, I think. Um, uh, rather than rather than um, covering generic and 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 uh, and global topics of climate change, we suggest uh, to engage students in bottom-up study of communities at local level, applying a conflict-sensitive and an adoptive approach. And rather than considering data and metrics as given facts, we invite students to critical and collaborative an analysis of health data through datatons and encourage students to challenge existing, existing matrix and generate alternative ones. And rather than focusing on antibiotic stewardship, viewing patients and doctors as rational actors, easily influenced by choosing wisely campaigns, we encourage students to identify and address obstacles to choose wisely prescribing by examining also the underlying system level drivers. And she takes on a medical humanities approach um, to the teaching of, of SDGs that seeks to broaden our understanding of health, illness, and sustainability by illuminating and interrogating uh, the power structures that shape these concepts, and also by emphasizing the entangled nature of cultural, economic, and biological systems. And here you can find the, the, the link to our, our comment. We'll then hand, on, hand over to my, my co-authors uh, for, uh, for uh, short reflections about, our, about the paper. And I will uh, we'll start with Trish Greenhouse, uh, who is a professor uh, of primary health care and social medicine at the University of Oxford. So please, Trish, the floor is yours. Authoring this paper and also a few months ago visiting you at uh, the Center for Sustainable Health Education. I spent a few weeks there at the end of last summer uh, in September, maybe it's autumn. Um, and I met some of your students and I met some of your staff and the, the, the passion and the the moral drive to actually do something about these different aspects of sustainability it was, was really palpable. Um, and it takes me back to my own student days, actually. I went to medical school in the late 1970s, and I was always the, the one that was had my hand up to question um, the assumptions. And I, I, was, I was actually seen as rather a naughty and, and, and difficult student. What I love about what you're doing at G is that you're you're trying to generate a whole generation of these difficult students who are not going to accept the standard metrics and the standard way of looking at these problems, but rather they have the capability to question. Um, and if they decide that the metrics 
that are being handed to them are uh, questionable, then they will start to develop their own metrics. But not only that, is you reward them for doing that. You don't penalize them. Uh, this is very radical educationally. And for me, um, I'm really pleased to see The Lancet um, has, has accepted this paper. I'm pleased to see it published. What I want to see now is this model that, that is really very radical at the University of Oslo uh, rolled out to other medical schools and also other, uh, other settings, other healthcare settings. I know we've got some nurses watching this webinar today. Um, you know that would be great and that's that's going to be a very very difficult challenge but one that uh i hope people are going to rise to that's probably enough for me thank you so much chris for uh for those reflections and yes uh definitely uh, uh and we still need to we still need to work to implement this both uh, both nationally and internationally um so then i will hand the uh, back to to you Ole Petter. Uh, there is a striking symmetry uh, between what uh, Sustainit and she uh, trying to do here in Oslo and what we try to do in Stockholm. So let me just uh, have uh, one or two minutes to um, recapitulate what we saw as the possibilities and also obstacles in Stockholm at Karolinska Institute when we try to do exactly what we are trying to do here, introduce the SDGs as a key topic in medical education. Uh, what we see is that uh, the complexity of these uh, sustainable development goals is such that uh, even medical students, many of them, uh, shy away from engaging simply because of the complexity. So there is a, among some of the students some sort of helplessness because the complexity is uh, perplexing and overwhelming. So I think uh, we here, or she, is on the right track trying to uh, convert a complexity and challenge, both embedded in the SDGs, to something that uh, energizes and inspires the students. That is the trick, I think, to have the students being inspired and energized by the SDGs. And uh, I think this is the key for having a sustainative, as I said, education, that not only do we uh, support and, uh, and uh, try to instill transformative skills, but we do this in the context of the sustainable development goals. And uh, I think uh, the uh, vision that you embody, Eivind, and uh, all the others that take part in this is the uh, correct one to really ensure that the medical profession is uh, interlinked and coupled to the humanities in a seamless way. And uh, the term entanglement is uh, beautiful because this is exactly what this is all about, to try to connect uh, over distance, uh, not only uh, uh, across uh, geographical distances, but also uh, um, um, uh, across disciplinary boundaries. So uh, the word entanglement is beautiful because it tells us exactly what this should be all about. But uh, my final 30 seconds will have to revolve around something that we have been discussing time and time again. And that is the more mundane and trivial issue, how to get this very exciting field of education embedded properly in the very busy curriculum, curriculum of medical education. This is a, a trivial thing to bring into the discussion, but a very important one. And the only way to succeed is to have all the teachers on board, or as many as possible, and to have the full support of the students, because this is not an easy thing to do, to revise a medical curriculum. Having taught medical students myself since, since 1976, I know how difficult it is to implement changes. So that's one of the challenges that we have to keep in mind. A very mundane one, but a very important one as well. Thank you. An extremely important one and, and challenging one. I suppose that we will have the opportunity to come to come back to that in the in the discussion. But I will now, now hand it over to uh, Tony Sunset, uh, who is a researcher at the Center for Sustainable Health uh, Care Education. Thank you, Ivan, and thank you all for participating today. And I'm really happy to be here. I'll I'll keep my comments uh, pretty brief and just catch up some of the things that I think. 
uh, is really um, important, but also uh, really uh, um, novel and, and, and new with the approach that, that the comment that we made. And I, I think also uh, one of the things that I think is really important is this idea of, of expanding upon what sustainable healthcare education can mean and should be. I think Jessime said it well, you know, that uh, usually we think about uh, sustainability as, um, as something to do with climate, but I think that that is obviously very important. But I think what, what our argument is, is that we need to think much broader upon the sustainab what sustainability means. We need to think about it across several dimensions, uh, the political, the social, and the ecological, and then transform that into uh, medical education. Obviously, a lot of health disparities in today's world are caused by unequalness and inequality, which has social and political and economical uh, foundations. And then climate comes on top of that and exacerbates the problem. Um, and I think one of the really exciting parts of, 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 of this comment and being part of this is, is that uh, this approach is also very sensitive to power and highlights power inequalities. And I think in a way, since we cited all the law and the master, uh, that the master tools will never uh, dismantle the master's house, I think also uh, this approach is a way of teaching and, and collaborating with students to speaking truth to power to actually, um, as we know, many of today's health challenges are caused by power inequalities. So that also means that students uh, should take part of and influence how we analyze interlocking systems uh, which create health inequalities. So in a way, actually, I think this approach is also a way of what we could call future-proofing medical education. That is, it has an eye towards the future and what looms on the horizon for healthcare providers of the near future, which I think is really crucial. And part of that is obviously um, having student-driven initiatives where students are, are really at the center and at the core of inventing and utilizing new tools. Uh, just to, to wrap up, I think health challenges of the 21st century can no longer rely on, on solutions for the 20th century. And I think really think and really believe that the lines that we've created, the partnerships that we created with, with students here really provides these 21st century solutions. And part of that is including um, a critical medical humanities approach, but also a, a sustainability approach that goes beyond the traditional understanding of what sustainability means. Um, and I think that is, uh, that is a very interesting and, and important part of, of this comment that we made. And then to speak to, to Ulle Petter's point, just to wrap up, I think obviously there are challenges of, of curriculum overload and implementing these things. These are, while, while they might seem trivial and mundane, without, I think these are very important things and, and, and looking for in taking this work forward. But I mean, this comment is a great starting point in the work that she is doing. And I'm very happy that the Lancet wanted to publish this as a signal of, of precisely providing 21st century solutions to health inequalities and problems. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for, for those important reflections. Uh, power issues, we'll need to, to come back to that too, I think. Uh, now I'm handing over to, to Kristin Hagen, who is one of the founders of Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education and now the, the deputy head. So please, Kristin. Thanks, Simon, uh, and thanks for this opportunity to comment on this paper about teaching sustainable healthcare premised on a more radical and critical approach to education. <clears throat> I will also take the opportunity to underline why this paper has been important for my own reflection about teaching. Uh, and my comments are based on a position as an experienced teacher and for the last yes, three years, part of the, the leadership group at the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education. And sustainability is an extremely powerful concept, but also empty, meaningless, innocent. And this fact triggers an interest for exploring power dynamics related to sustainability. And my serious interest for this concept started in 2015 
when Paul Farmer was visiting the University of Oslo. And he referred to different paradoxes inherent in the concept sustainability, which could have possible implications for health. And we, I went, Enge Bretsen and Ole Petr Ottersen, we studied policy documents and identified conceptual drifts or shifts in the concept of sustainability across different policy documents. And from there on, I really had a very keen interest in the, the concept of sustainability and the, the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. And as a teacher, I do experience that students, as well as my colleague teachers, are fascinated by the story of the development of the United Nations SDGs. And the fact that they actually used three years to develop these goals. Uh, and it was filled, these three years were filled with conflicts, drafts, negotiations, before they agreed upon the goals as we know them today. And it, it, it was of course a big achievement to agree upon a global roadmap with 17 goals and 169 targets. We, we sort of have a lens to consider the complex interrelations between the goals. And the COVID-19 pandemics has indeed highlighted the existing health inequalities, not to mention the lack of global solidarity when it comes to the distribution of vaccines, for instance. As, sorry, as teachers, we have the responsibility for teaching our students to be able to analyze sustainability problems, cutting across and integrate different sectors with relevance for healthcare, analyze cross differences between the SDGs with the competence to identify critical actors and stakeholders and possibly identify intervention points. So the paper argues convincingly the need to introduce a new educational paradigm based on system thinking combined with critical thinking. And I'm pleased to mention that our center next year will launch a new program, a so-called honor certificate, which is premised on, um, uh, on a sort of a new paradigm in healthcare education, namely a system thinking, and it's inspired by critical medical humanities. So hopefully we can come back to that. Thanks for me so far. Thank you, Christine. An empty, is it an, is sustainability an empty signifier or is it a floating signifier? I don't know. We can come back to that too. Uh, Last but not least, we are also, of course, we have a student uh, on board on this paper. And uh, Ritika Sharma is a medical student at the University of Oslo and also um, uh, a student uh, leader associated with our Center for Sustainable Health Education. So Ritika, please. Yes, hi everyone. First of all, I'm very thankful and honored to be a part of this wonderful comment on Lancet. Uh, so from a student perspective, this article emphasizes the importance of students as change agents in challenging our own educational and social structures to foster a sustainable society. And in order to foster a sustainable healthcare education, all while enhancing our formal education, we must think, be, and act critical and speculative, both relating to the way we learn and the way we are taught in our respective curriculum. In an explicit move away from conventional one SDG at a time curriculum, she has encouraged student-led initiatives that serve to enhance students' own professional, moral, and ethical perspectives on the intersection between sustainability and health. 
So for instance, she has an initiative on an annually student-led conference where a range of experts are brought together to participate in an intersectional panel discussion and workshops regarding the connection between SDG3 and other sustainability related topics, such as nutrition, technology and innovation and environmental health. So in this way, students are actively providing and encouraging each other in using our own medical, medical structured knowledge and applying it into real life problems regarding our very own future. Because if we as students can't take responsibility regarding our own future, then who will? So I really hope this article can serve to inspire and encourage other students with the same engagement as we and she have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fritika, for, um, for bringing in this uh, student perspective and discussion uh, and for uh, accepting to collaborating with us on this paper. Uh, then I'm extremely proud and, uh, and glad to introduce our, um, our next speaker who has accepted to comment on, uh, on, uh, on this paper, uh, Magda Rubalo, uh, who is uh, a former uh, Minister of Health of, of, uh, of Guinea-Bissau, and who is now also the president and the co-founder of the Institute for Global Health and, and Development. And uh, I'm so glad that you have accept, accepted to, to provide your, your comments on this paper, Magda. You're, I can also mention that you're also accepted to be part of our international advisory board. So you were also uh, recently uh, accepted that role. So thank you for all your support and for, for being here today. For me, really, to, to thank you for this opportunity. I'm very pleased and honored to uh, have been invited to give a commentary uh, on this just uh, published uh, Lancet um, uh, comment on teaching sustainable healthcare through the critical uh, medical humanities. And I thank uh, the Lancet also for uh, accepting to publish it. I think. Uh, this is the beginning uh, or um, a, a pivotal moment for us to be uh, thinking about how do we um, sustainably uh, transform medical education uh, for us to have a better a better world. Um, along with the, uh, the, the authors of the article, I also want to commend and congratulate the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education of University of Oslo Faculty of Medicine for the leadership uh, demonstrated in adopting an innovative and transformative approach. I've now learned that is also sustainable uh, approach to medical education uh, introduced to teach about the sustainable development goals and uh, uh, is anchored in on critical medical humanities uh, inaugurating, uh, if I may call it, a new era in medical education. I, um, towards the end, I will uh, uh, also uh, support the, um, the best wishes of everyone here to see how quickly, how fast we can uh, spread this uh, innovative approach across the world and uh, uh, no matter how difficult changing curricula is, uh, but uh, if we don't have the courage to do it, we will. there is no point of creating a new approach that will change things if uh, we don't push for it to be adopted mm -hmm. and implemented. Um, as William, Vinay and colleagues have stated, medical humanities are a powerful tool uh, to address not only the meaning and historical cultural context in the plurality of health and illness. Uh, others have added that uh, medical humanities have the potential uh, to disrupt and broaden, uh, and I quote, the overly reductive materialist and scientific definitions of human experience uh, promoted by, my, by my biomedicine and counterbalance the restricted and restrictive views of science, end of quote with new ways of teaching, learning, and practicing medicine, 
to transform the health and well-being of people in the society, which is now 8 billion strong. Medical education has not kept pace uh, with the world's evolution. Uh, medical schools uh, curricula, as you know better than I do, uh, remain essentially focused on biomedical science and the narrow definitions of health and illness. Uh, myself, um, um, I've um, taken time or uh, I, I take bits of uh, time that is uh, left uh, to, to study political science and um, international relations. And I can understand how narrow my training uh, as a medical doctor has been. And uh, I have, uh, uh, I'm happy to have chosen to expand my horizon and uh, deep dive into uh, other humanities to better understand the, the, the space of global health. Um, Time has come for us to interrogate and disrupt the norms, the values, the assumptions, and the beliefs of prevailing narratives and discourses with the sharpened critical spirits, recognizing our conscious and unconscious biases. The article uh, is timely, as I said, it's a timely contribution to the ongoing debate around transforming the global health architecture, decolonizing global health, and the need for new or improved global governance mechanisms to protect our common public goods. This article is also, uh, in my view, a major contribution uh, toward the three high-level meetings uh, that will be happening in September in New York around the United Nations General Assembly uh, and the ongoing consultations with member states, the private sector and civil society. Why do I say this? Um, to be relevant, none of the resolutions uh, that will come out of the three high level meetings on universal health coverage on pandemic preparedness and response and on tuberculosis, none of the resolutions will be relevant if they ignore uh, what I found to be the essential arguments of this article embodied in the citation of Audre Lorde's statement and I quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. To me, this is such a critical argument in this article. And that's what should drive the energy that we need to transform the way our students are taught, how they learn and how they uh, provide healthcare, how they think about health and illness. To create sustainable change, the systems, the hierarchies, and the structures that created the problems we seek to solve must be challenged. And of course, you have all read this in the, uh, in the article. So to me, the three uh, United Nations high-level meetings in September will deal with the slide back on sustainable development goals and will have to be creative about fast-tracking progress for all goals as intertwined as they are, but particularly uh, the goals on health, on gender, on climate and poverty and on education, not forgetting the goals on partnerships. Preventing the next pandemic uh, will not be possible without a new level of thinking and acting to dismantle the root causes of the challenges we are confronted with today. And I agree uh, with the authors of the article in that sustainability is interdisciplinary. It cannot, it should not be oversimplified nor uh, narrowly defined. Uh, innovations and co-creation in the epistemological space should bring discomfort and should bring disruption. And we should accept that as part of evolution toward a better, safer, and more equal world. I have captured three main themes from uh, this uh, comment in The Lancet. 
uh, which uh, connects with the global and the local context. So the first team that uh, I found uh, very critical uh, in, the, um, in the article is the team of radical change and radical social change, uh, which uh, is embedded in the uh, radical pedagogical philosophy by the sustainable healthcare education as reported in the article. No doubt that cultural diversity and cross-cultural dialogue is central to radical change, as it necessarily brings about the need to challenge norms and theories and deconstruct centuries-old narratives. The notion of cultural humility and diversity awareness to develop and cultivate intercultural competence is a legacy that all medical education programs should embrace to remain relevant and contribute to shape a better world where social justice will prevail. The second team um, that I found critical in this article is the team of entanglement. And I will add the notion of productive entanglement with the biomedical culture and its limitations. The authors discuss the importance of critical thinking, system thinking, and I think we should also add risky thinking uh, as uh, important to be uh, transferred to the students to instill democratic debates and constructive disagreements, to transform conflicts into positive engagement and dialogue and develop collaborative relationships. This dimension of plurality, while engaging with complexity and ambiguity is paramount to achieve difficult compromises, which are key definitions of how the sustainable development goals are arrived at. It is all about difficult compromises. It is all about ambiguity. The own concept of sustainability is an ambiguous concept, difficult to grasp with. The third team uh, for me um, is the team of decolonizing medical education and practice. Here, I think uh, the article was a little bit too shy and uh, probably fell short of addressing the explicit or implicit imbalances of power and seeking to challenge the current power structures and explore the intersectionality of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, disability, and their role in creating social and environmental inequalities based on which the so-called evidence-based knowledge is produced and is taught. Decolonizing medical education will contribute to secure new voices and perspectives, particularly the voices from the global South, bringing in different views and values and creating new resources and new evidence. Health, as you know, is inherently political and Cognizant of its political dimension, we should create opportunities for medical students to learn that the global health space, health and well being spaces are uneven, and that illness and good health are unevenly produced. As final reflections, I would like to mention the need for us to continue exploring the potential of medical humanities monitor its trajectory and propose critical pathways for its evolution. We need to continue pushing for social justice, equal societies, eradication of racism and inequities, and we should do so fearlessly. There is a blowing wind of opportunities that we should seize if transformative and sustainable medical education is something for us to think about, to practice and 
use as a weapon to contribute to a better world. I thank you very much once again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Magda, for this fantastic commentary. Uh, I, uh, I, I, it's such a privilege to, to, to hear such a good reading of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of our texts, uh, both in terms of the, the points that you highlight. And also, I appreciate that you say that we have been a little too shy on uh, <laughs> on one of the points, and I, I actually I, I I actually agree with you. Uh, I'm sure that um, uh, the panel uh, members of the panel would like to respond to to uh, this, and we also have some very interesting uh, comments in the in the in the chat that we can also bring into the discussion. We have we have some time now, and so. Ole Petter, would you? What are your reflections? Yes, uh, thank you to Magda. I think you are spot on when you say that uh, we have to look into uh, the power asymmetries that uh, make uh, make it very difficult today, in fact, to embark on uh, this uh, line of teaching. Um, so one thing is, of course, the uh, power asymmetries that are embedded in the term uh, the uh, colonizing global health absolutely very, very important. But uh, I know this very well from the inside, having been a university president for almost 14 years, first at um, Oslo and then in, in Stockholm, that there are other power struggles that uh, we have to take into account. Mm -hmm. And one very important power struggle is simply what kind of time perspective should we have as universities? And what we are seeing today increasingly is uh, what we could call a short-termism, that uh, the uh, political decision makers, they expect us to interact with industry, with the private sector, with the society, as we see it today, to bring short-term benefits to society. And that's good. But uh, we must know that we as universities, we are stewards of the long-term perspective. We are the real stewards of the term sustainability, because these terms that go beyond the political horizon of those who we elect. So we must not miss this opportunity to, to really work for future generations with a long-term perspective. And that means also, of course, that we should not only uh, look at uh, universal health coverage, because that has no time perspective in it, we should look for how to build universal preparedness for health to ensure that what we do as uh, medical practitioners and teachers also uh, relates to the health of future generations. So we have to uh, take into account the fact that we must work for a better health for all. And that means across geographical boundaries, across socioeconomic strata, but also across um, generations. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for those important points that you raised, Ole Petter. And I think that uh, kind of a something that goes through all the different uh, talks uh, is also the idea of expanding that uh, expanding both in in scope and now what you stress also in time how we think around health health issues. Uh, and uh, but but uh, I mean. To expand uh, is not without difficulties either. And one of the one thing that is raised in the chat here is uh, is also what are your views on the role of local and traditional healers and healthcare healthcare practitioners in the development of a curriculum? How can or uh, will their voices be heard and incorporated? That also ties into this. How how how. Uh, uh, broad shall our, our, our concept and scope be, so to speak. Trish, do you have any comments? Um, it, it raises all sorts of issues about um, what I call um, epistemic um, trespassing, shall we say, or, or um, that, well, what I mean by that, that's the, the jargon term, but the, the idea that within medical schools, particularly in the global north, we are teaching a very particular 
look at health, a very particular biomedical, um, this is the body, this is the way it becomes diseased, these are, are drugs that treat the disease, et cetera, et cetera. And whilst traditional healers and other health-related roles, and, and not homogeneous, of course, you know, we, we, we're talking about a very wide range of different roles in, in different societies, but certainly what I've learned in, in visiting uh, different countries, particularly in the global south, is that people taking on those roles um, have, have those roles have grown within particular cultures and the knowledge that it that is embodied and enshrined within those roles uh, and the social relations enshrined within those roles um, cannot be explained or fully analyzed through the lens of biomedicine. So that's one thing. I would, however, say, you know, I am a medical doctor, and of course, the medical literature is replete with examples of the wrong kind of herb being given by a particular healer and someone's liver got damaged and all that kind of thing. So, so I'm not I'm not saying we should look at traditional healing practices uncritically, but I certainly think that we should be learning and students should be learning um, about why and how particular roles have emerged. And I suppose the, the one that I'm, I'm most interested in at the moment, just because I'm, I happen to be marking a dissertation about it, is traditional birth attendants and um, doulas. And, you know, I think it's a really good example of where the embodied knowledge from, from a, a particular traditional role um, is something that, that we... Uh, in tradition, in in biomedicine, can can learn from. I don't know. How do you teach it in your um, in in she even? How, how do you address this? No, I I, uh, I think this is one of the this is the point one of the points that needs more uh, that we need to deal better with. I think, Tony. I saw that you had your hand up. Yeah, I just briefly wanted to to comment on what Trish said on, on this, because I was thinking, well, I, I agree with Trish that, you know, we should also apply a critical lens to, to those kind of healing practices. Uh, I think it also has to do with trust and recognition. I think one of the things that we can do, obviously, is to recognize different voices and the plurality of epistemic position as an invite to build trust, right? So mm -hmm. obviously COVID-19 was, was also a, a crisis of trust. And I think uh, part of health inequality stems from this mistrust, and and uh, I think what what needs to be done, and which is part of the colonial uh, like uh, decolonial practices, is also the, like a politics of recognition, not necessarily putting every epistemic thing on its equal footing, but at least recognizing different narratives and voices, and then invite people to the table and have a conversation, because that builds trust. People. Who are recognized obviously that is the the first step towards building trust and rapport and then we can have a discussion on the epistemic value of it i think yeah that's important uh, i see one uh, fair comment in the chat here about uh, us not talking or only talking about medical schools uh, and not uh, and not nursing uh, schools in our paper uh, that's uh, i i think that's uh, uh, that's a shortcoming of our terminology. We definitely mean to to include all uh, all health professionals in this debate, and we're talking also about uh, health humanities here, uh, not only uh, also including allied health sciences, and not not only medicine. So uh, point taken. Uh, I, I just want to bring one final point into the discussion from the chat before I give the, 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 the word to you, Magda and uh, Jessamy, for some final comments. But uh, because One Health, someone has asked in the chat here about what about One Health? And also I see One Health ethics. What is the, uh, what is the relation between uh, this approach that we are outlining here and One Health approach? Uh, but please, Magda. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly comment on the issue of uh, traditional healers. I think uh, the, um, the critical thinking, the systems thinking uh, that uh, is embedded 
uh, into a new curricula would um, uh, give people their own way of looking at embracing, analyzing, assessing the relevance of traditional healers into the broader health system. So uh, once again, uh, there is no um, one size fits all. Traditional healers in some places, particularly in the global south, in, uh, in the African continent, have a major role to play. And if you want to um, define which role would they play in other geographies, that, that is left to really how the metrics are challenged, how the outcomes uh, of uh, uh, health are, uh, are defined, and uh, that's uh, the, a democratic debate to, to, to have, uh, I would think. Thank you for that comment. Uh, Jessamy. So much. I just wanted to briefly build on some of the things that people have said already about um, oh. epistemic injustices and trespassing and uh, traditional ways of knowing. I mean, I do think that we're going through a huge transformation as part of decolonization of questioning across space and time what knowledge has been developed and, and why that knowledge has been developed. And I think in this sort of critical approach that, that everybody is advocating here, we also have to recognize medicine's role in that. You know, I'm reading a, a book at the moment called Less Is More by Jason Hickel about, you know, degrowth. And in that, he provides a very comprehensive historical perspective of how a kind of animalist view of the world, of humans being part of the ecosystem and, and part of, you know, the animal world and needing it, actually had to be broken by philosophers, by physicians, by scientists into a much more dualist approach where it's very human centric and it's just about medicine, it's just about health, it's about the human at the center. So I think that there's an awful lot that we are in currently questioning and progressing towards that we must to be able to get to a space where we can realign where humans role is within the world, within the ecosystem and, and elsewhere. And, and as healthcare professionals, I think we've got a lot of questioning to do on that um, and, and on our role of how we've got into the situation that we're in. Mm. Thank you for that. We are running out of time, unfortunately. Many other things that we could have discussed, but I would like to invite Ritika to just uh, as a final comment about what for the future, what should be the main focus of she from here? I think the main focus for she should be to, can, I think we're on the right path and we have to continue on this path, working with students, for students, and also encouraging all the educators of the medical faculty and also healthcare faculties um, to, to continue to promise that what, what our vision is. So we have a huge task to do, and and I think yeah, I think we ha we are have a good start now. Thank you. I'm so glad to, that we have you and the students on board. Um, thank you all for for joining. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to, uh, to the Lancet, and a special thanks to you, Magda Rubalo, for providing these fantastic comments and this uh, insightful reading of our comment. So thank you all. Thank you so much, everyone. And let's press ahead. Uh, we shouldn't be shy. We should carry on. Thank you, everyone. Bye.